And it just so happened, there's a recent game from 2020, The Lost Ruins of Arnak, or Arnak, or Arnak, uh, which is moderately popular, got a pretty high rating on Board Game Geek right now. And also, it happens to be supported on Board Game Arena, so the stars came together and we played it the other day. I've only played yeah, it had once. A friend who, I had a friend who learned it and, and went out of their way to teach it to us, and that helped a lot. Uh, Designed by Min Elwin? So yeah, so this game is a game that combines basically two of the biggest mechanics in the Euro gaming world, deck building like Dominion and worker placement like every worker placement game ever, Agricola, right? So we had already previously played a game that did a similar thing, the same combination, which is Dude Imperium. Uh, I don't think we did a show on it. Nope, because I it got once. I got to play that one again before I have an opinion that I'm well, going to share publicly. Just because we didn't do a show right away, so it wasn't fresh in our minds. Not but just this, that, we but only... we our first playthrough had several errors and issues that I need to play again with knowledge to decide if I like the game or not. I need to like reread the rules. It's yeah. been so long. Uh, but Ruins of Arnak, we just played it the other day, uh, and it was much simpler and easier to comprehend in our minds. It's much more streamlined. Uh, you know and whatnot so uh i don't feel like we need to play it again to do an episode we and that, we can't obviously talk about how to win yep <laughs> especially not the way i played i played like trash yep i did okay but uh but i was i was basically doing what the player who won was doing but one round behind worse. him so yeah <laughs> um but yeah so obviously you know it, it take the two biggest mechanics of euro gaming that are and combine them into one game that's obviously a great idea it's you know going to be a, a winner uh i enjoyed both of those games so far i don't know if there's any other games that have attempted that combo i expect more to come but you know both of those games i enjoyed uh ruins of arnak i think was like the you know, more accessible. Uh, the theme is obviously less fun because it's not Dune. There's no worms and, and yep. whatnot. But it's um, just, the game is very like elegant for this kind of game. Like you're matching all these mechanics together, but they're matched together pretty elegantly. It's a very fast play once you know the rules. Like this is a mm -hmm, 20 mm -hmm. to 30 minute game among people. Well, who I think the reason it's a fast play is, is for two reasons. Number one, it does the thing I like where on your turn you do an action and then it's the next person's turn. You don't take your whole goddamn turn yep. like root and then everyone else takes a nap, right? You do one action that it goes around and then you do one action that goes around like ticket to ride. So yep. that makes it feel faster because you're constantly you're doing actions and you're not waiting too much um and two the game is always a set number of rounds and it's not that many it's like five six it's not a lot it's of five. rounds five rounds ever no matter what it's five rounds yeah so you're really only taking and especially in the early rounds you're taking like two actions in the later rounds maybe six or seven, you know, not that many actions. And you've yep. got two workers and that's all you ever get. You start with two workers and end with two workers. Yep. So it sidesteps so a fundamental issue with most worker placement games is that if they're not designed extremely well, the get more workers action ends up being the most important thing in the right. game. And that tends yep. to cause certain styles of play that aren't actually that fun. In Ruins of Arnak, you are, you know, the, the act, there are some actions where you don't need workers, but of the actions that you do need workers, the big actions, you basically have 10 actions the whole game. That's it. It's take 10 actions, game over. So it's going to be a quick one, and each action is going to matter a lot. We'll get back to that. Some actions don't need workers because that actually really adds to this game. And. I will actually, what I would compare this game the most to of all the games I could say, I don't, th I don't know if you'll agree, but I played this game more. It, it, it does a lot of what Everdell does in terms of your directional heuristics, but it does them so much better. Mm. I mean, yeah, I, I think I got to compare it the most to Dune Imperium still, which is another game that is worker placement and yep. deck building. So basically, the theme is a, is a typical, you're exploring some ancient ruins in some forgotten yeah, continent somewhere. Some sort of, you know, fantasy, archaeology, Indiana Jones deal. Yep. You, know, you know the theme. But, the, but the game, at least, it On makes it pile clear board games. it's not a real world place. Nor are there any people there at all. Like, they're very explicit about that. And there is a temple with ridiculous magic nonsense in it. And you're the first people ever setting foot here, basically. No. But you're still looting an ancient or lost civilization that just, you know, of some kind. Yeah. So... Basically, you've got this board that has some near areas that are like a base camp, some kind of far away areas and some really far away areas, and then uh, an exploration like track on the right. 
So on the on the first part, you can spend movement actions to put a worker in one of these places. And the further away it is, the harder it is to get to. And there can be monsters and there's resources. And you basically well, there will be monsters. Yeah. You're basically opening up more spaces to put workers to get resources and also get victory points. And then the track is the most fascinating thing because it's really the core of the game. You're basically spending resources to move your hour, your uh, your book and your magnifying glass up this track. And yep. there's different paths through the track that require different resources. A little bit clank-like in that regard, like spend spend two arrowheads and a ruby to move from this space to this space. Mm. And the shtick is that as you move the magnifying glass up, you get increasing numbers of victory points. It's clearly the primary way to get victory points. And whoever gets to places first gets additional boons. And then there's some endgame scoring at the top. Moving your book up gives you way fewer victory points, but it gets you powers on your own board. And the sort of interesting fun mechanic there is you can never move your book past your magnifying glass. And all that yeah, combined right? the magnifying glass symbolizes like you're, you know, you're investigating, right? You're looking at artifacts, you're, you know, you're you're look right. And then the book symbolizes you're recording your findings, yep. right? Publishing. Uh, what you've learned for the world, right? You Which can is, choose I to just never, never move your book. Just explore on your own and then go home satisfied. Like you could do that. That's a valid strategy. Yep. Um, you probably wouldn't win, but you, you nope. could do it. <laughs> and otherwise, the only other thing on the board really is a track that has artifacts and items that you can buy. Uh, artifacts and items are basically just cards that you put into your deck. The deck building yep. is important, but the deck you build is extremely small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the items are basically early in the game, the card market is mostly items. Uh, and the item cards are not very powerful. Uh, some of them can be and if you get good combos and whatnot. Um, but, you know, they, they do good stuff, right? But you know, they're also easy to get and you just sort of play them. The... Uh, the artifact cards are very powerful. And when you buy one, it activates immediately. Yep. Right? But if you, if you draw an artifact again later, after like you bought it, it activated immediately. It eventually makes its way into your deck. You draw it again. If you want to play it again, you actually have to spend a tablet resource every time you play one. And so it's harder to get the repeat effect on the artifacts. Mm -hmm. And as the game goes on, that card market where you can get new cards from shifts to basically consist of more artifacts and less items. So it's like eventually at the end of the game, it's like, yeah, you know, first of all, it's late in the game. Why are you even buying items? <laughs> They're so weak. Yep. But also, right, it's like, here's more artifacts to choose from late in the game. You know, go ahead. And especially if you buy them late in the game, you probably will never draw them. You're just going to buy them, get their immediate effect. And they are worth victory points. Even though the most victory points comes from the magnifying glass, there are so many, every, pretty much everything you do gives some number of victory and points. And a good thing about this game, one victory point matters. And three victory points is kind of like the unit of significant advancement. Like three victory points is a big fuck you to everyone else at the table. But one victory point could could easily make or break the game for you. Yep. Sure enough. So the cards in your deck are interesting too. Because remember what we said earlier. You have two workers, but you could take more than two actions. Mo actions some actions require you put a worker down to do a thing. Usually the worker things involve getting resources. and Cards can be used as free actions to do a thing, usually give you a resource of a particular type, but they can also do other things depending on what the card says. And you keep going around, taking turns until you pass. Once you pass, you're out. So you could use all your cards first and then use your two workers. You could use a worker to do a thing, use a bunch of cards, then use another a wor your second worker to do a thing that you couldn't have done before. You could mess up and not have any workers left, and then there's a thing you really wanted to do that someone else unlocked or changed the, the state of the game. So you're always having this decision of what do I do and how do I limit my options? Uh, because every action you take severely limits what additional remaining actions you can take in a given turn. 
So yeah, the, the two workers that you have, basically the actions they do are the ones in the middle of the board, yeah. right? Go explore a new spot. Uh, go collect resources from the, the camps at the bottom, the easy free spots. Uh, fight a monster, right? Those sorts of things. You could only do that twice per turn, right? And that's it. You, you got yeah. the two workers at the end. All the moving the magnifying glass, that's just spending resources. You spend yeah. resources and you move it. You know, that's just an action, right? Buying a card, you just... You know, you just get the resources and you just buy the card from the market. You don't need a worker yep. to do that. But it is your so, action. So, for example, if you have no valid actions on your turn, you are forced to pass even if you didn't want to. So, yep. you might do actions that make sure you have additional possible actions to stay in the round, hoping someone else will do something, waiting for a new item to come out. There's a lot of surprising tactical depth for how simple this game is because of that. The other thing yeah, this, this does... This, it, this, uh, there's that typical balance, right? Normally, in a worker placement game, a lot of them tend to either swing in one direction or the other, right? One direction being, I want to get my workers out first yep. to get the spots before they get blocked. Because yes, indeed, in this game, if someone else went to that spot, you can't go there. Uh, but also... Some worker placement games, you're like, well, I kind of want to hold out to the end. I have the most information, right? Then I can go, I can run wild with my workers, right? On whatever remains, um, you know, blocked or not blocked. In this game, you're sort of, con since it goes around and around and around, you're sort of in this constant, like, struggle between the two, right? If I put out my workers quickly, right, run one, two, then that's sort of it. <laughs> And I won't be able to respond to anything that else that happens, yep. but I'll get what I wanted. But if I hold out, well, yeah, sure, you're going to get more info, maybe get what you wanted, right? So you actually have both pressures at once, or is that I think in a lot of other worker placement games, only one of the two pressures is present at any given time. But the most important thing this does is that the, the way these actions play out and the way the magnifying glass and book track works where you're limited is like once you move onto a space you can only move to other adjacent spaces as you go up. So you're, it's constraining what resources you will need, which reduces the cognitive load of considering all the possible options. If all your biz doesn't need rubies to advance, you don't need to worry about rubies on the board, most likely. So you can avoid some of the analysis paralysis that happens with more open games. Well, there's only three, there's only three, like there's, there's, there's two resources, right? The compass and what's the other one? Well, there's compasses, uh, there's gold, there's rubies, right, and compasses, there's arrowheads. Right, so compass, right. And so tablets. compasses, right. So compasses are mostly used for traveling to get your workers to go to more yep. distant places, right? But uh, some gold, artifacts use them. Some right, other well, things use yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gold is mostly used for getting cards, right? So those yep. are your like early game resources that mostly are used to build up your engine. The other three resources, the tablet, the ruby, and the arrowhead, are sort of the victory point, move your magnifying glass, do research resources, right? Which are mostly used for that purpose. Um, but then each resource has a little bit of extra, right? It's like towards the top of the track, for victory points, you're eventually going to need some compasses to go with the magnifying glass, yep. right? To play an artifact card, like I said before, you're going to need a spare tablet resource left over from somewhere, you know? So they do mix it up, you know, uh, a little bit with the costs to keep it interesting. It's not like locked yep. in. They um, even have a really clever win more at the very end of the game. If you make it to the top of that track, there's like this pyramid of extra victory points you can buy out of where there's three places that require different amounts of resources and you can buy one two or three of them in any combination every round if you somehow are sitting up there with extra resources at the end of the game i guess the the last thing is that every card in addition to having like an effect of some kind if it's like an item right or you know even like the basic cards the game just gives you from the start like you can spend them for free to get a compass or a yep. gold or whatever they every, every card has some sort of travel possibility uh, on it yep so, boots boats cars planes right boots boats cars so it's like when you want to tr send your worker out into the world not only do you need enough compasses to get them where they're going so you have to get those compasses from somewhere you also have to have you know play cards with enough correct 
transportation symbols. So now you can't use those cards for what their effect was because you had to use those cards to, to make the worker go to the spot that you wanted. And so then you get some tough choices as well, right? Um, sometimes you might pick up a crappy item just because, well, I'll use it as an airplane on it, right? You know, whatever. Yep. So you might be forced to be like, oh, I really want to play this this good item, but that's the only way I can get that worker out is to use it as a boat. And well, if I don't do that, then the worker won't even get used this turn. What do I do? Yeah. So this is the, this is sort of where the reason I want to compare and contrast this a little bit to Everdell is that Everdell, while it's a very different game. This game and Everdell share a few very like core heuristics in that in the early game. You're buying items and sort of either collecting resources or collecting ways to collect resources. And in the later game, you're doing victory points and other stuff. But the big difference is Everdell, as you get into later phases of the game, the possibilities open up and explode and cause in extreme analysis paralysis. But in this game... Your options are constrained by the decisions you have made up to this point, so it never opens up enough for you to get just completely overwhelmed with options. If I you're in a spot a where you need a ruby a and you don't have a, a ruby, lot. you fucked up. You should have gotten a ruby. You could see it coming the whole time. I do think that is a problem for just many games in general, right? Is that, you know, you think about, like, you know, something like, Monopoly or well, characters or in the games. It's bushiness. Right? The the concept yeah, of bushiness. The, you cannot have a game where bushiness increases over time. That will greatly extend the length of yeah, that game. A lot, right? A lot of games. The bushiness goes up and up and up and up. Like Civ Six, you know, any Civ really. Towards the end of the game, the bushiness is huge. You got a ton of cities, a ton of units. It's just like it's too big, right? You got to deal with all this crap, right? And usually, early in games, you don't want to start people out with like a whole pile of resources right at the beginning. That's yep. too. It's like you didn't earn it. So the bushiness is small in the beginning. And like I think a lot of training games, take a loan. <laughs> That's exactly. the only thing you can do. Take a loan. <laughs> Right. So I think, you know, the ideal game is going to increase bushiness quickly, right? To get your options out and early. And then winnow that bushiness then, down. Right. Constrain them and push the game towards a conclusion. And this constrains you by A, it's hard to get a huge pile of resources mm -hmm. uh, and keep, there's no engine building really, right? You just, you, you don't build, there's like no way. You might get, get one combo between like an assistant and an artifact, yeah. but. I tried it, when I played, I tried to take the dominion path of, aha, I'll build and, and make a, a really polished deck of deck. Oh, you had the best deck by far. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'll clear the crap out of my deck. I'll bring in all the really powerful cards into my deck. I'll build an amazing deck. And hopefully then I'll draw this ridiculous hand of amazing cards, play them and score a pile of points, right? And the thing is, it took so long because you have so few actions to build that amazing deck took all five rounds. Yep. And I was never, if there were six or seven rounds, I would have won for sure. But there weren't six or seven rounds. There were five rounds. And I had not scored basically any victory points worth of shit because I couldn't get the valuable resources because I was spending my resources on polishing my deck instead. And there was, there aren't a lot of, I had basically all the draw mechanics that you could get and there aren't enough of them. So it's not like yeah. I, could, I could, I was drawing cards during my turn as much as anyone could. And it wasn't enough to like play some combo. It's like you can only do so much. You start with two workers. You end with two workers. It's like that's it. Your 10 worker actions are the whole game, right? Plan those out and you're done. GG. So second point of comparison between this and Everdell. The cards are the reason the game does not fall into a stale meta. The cards are the thing that shuffles the game up. Same with Everdell. Yep. The Different cards, cards are, every time. Yep, yep. The cards guide like what's possible, what people are fighting over, etc. But... The cards do not use a lot of word language so much as they have a very simple lexicon of very straightforward actions with symbols. So it takes a couple seconds to figure out what a new card does and no card... As long as you have the how, the how to play guide is necessary for yep. some of the symbols, right? It's it's not quite a race for the galaxy situation, nope. but you do need a little guide a cheat sheet to, to understand some of the cards. But none but of the not cards... there's not that many symbols. You'll learn them all pretty quickly. And none of the cards do anything particularly crazy out of the bounds of what you would expect. Look at, like If you look at 10% of the cards, you've got a good sense of what 100% of the cards are capable of. I think we had one late game card question because yep. there was some some bad wording but 
Look at Everdell. But to, we looked up, we looked it up, and we got an answer. So Everdell, the cards have a whole bunch of language you have to parse, and the cards interact with each other in really complex ways. That's why Everdell takes four hours to play. And while Board Game Geek weirdly says this game takes 30 to 120 minutes, I cannot imagine a game of this taking longer than 45 minutes. No, I can't. It, it, it's only five rounds. What are you doing? Yeah. There, but... I like it. I like it a lot. I want to play it again, like, soon. And I think it has a lot of replay value because the cards are key. They are how you construct the decks, but you make such a small deck. I don't think this will fall into a hard meta under 10 to 12 plays. Like, I think you could get 10 or 12 plays out of this, and they would all be satisfying. Right. I think it does, like you said, I think it has replay value. You could play this a bunch. But you could exhaust it. But it doesn't have the infinite replay value of like a T&E. It's like or you a can play it a bunch. Right. You can play it a bunch, but then you're going to be done with it. However, it's very obvious if there aren't expansions for this well, already. It comes which with an could- expansion. You flip over the board and there's like the Temple of the Snake and everything's different. Oh, okay. So there you go. There's some replay value. But yeah, this game not only does, I guess, it come with an expansion, the Temple of the Snake, yep. but it is ripe for further expansion oh yeah just release a deck of deck of weird artifacts another sideboard you can advance on like add a sixth round just put out different cards be like all right play with deck two instead of deck one it's like it's so easy to expand this game they absolutely will if they haven't already i just haven't looked up whether they have already yep um and i think that's where you can get even more replay value from out of this but you know even if you they never release an expansion and you do play it out you know, whatever this game costs or whatever it costs to play on Board Game Arena, I don't know if it's one of the free ones or one of the ones where you have to... I think it's free. There's basically the way Board Game Arena works, if people don't know, is it's it's a website that lets you play board games against people online, and it works, so that's really good, but the UI is really not great, but, but it works, yep. uh, and they have a lot of top-tier board games on there, you know, uh, ranging from all sorts of different weight levels and whatnot, but... If you want to start a new game, like if you want to play Six Nymphed, you can just like play Six Nymphed on there for free. If you want to play some games, like I wanted to play, uh, what was it called? Uh, Don't Stop or whatever, or Can't Stop. It's like, well, I didn't have a premium account. So if someone else who did have a premium account started a game of Can't Stop, they could invite me to join it. Even Might just be worth paying. it for what, like me to get a premium account, because. Uh, but looks like if we're gonna you be have a down premium a account, you can start a new game of any game. But if you have a free account, you can only yep. join games created by premium accounts or start games if they're free games. I will warn you so, on this: if you play this on Board Game Arena, it works great, but. Any card, Scott got burned by this. Uh, two different I players got burned. burned by If there's a card where you can get a resource thing or pass to get a different resource thing, you have to pass via the card. If you just click pass, yep. you're just SOL. Yep, that's what happened to me. It's And that's a that's a user interface board game arena problem. Yeah, nothing Not to do with the game itself. That, the, that the card never was really happened straightforward. If we're, if we're playing in person, there's no way that can happen. Exactly. Right? So... Um, I would, I don't know if I would buy this game only because, like, personally, not saying you shouldn't buy it, only because, one. Well, it probably takes up a lot of space. It's big. It's not a small game. Yep. I don't uh, know when I'll be playing board, games in person big box. anytime soon. Right. But also, this is the kind of game that, like, the PAX Tabletop Library will probably have two or three copies of. And this is the kind of game, if I was at any random PAX, I would check it out at least once and play it, like, every PAX. Yeah. Yeah, you know, play it. Well, you know, play it once, put it back. Right? You know, it's, yeah. If you're a person who has board game nights, uh, still somehow, uh, and you've got it, only goes up to four players. I think. Yeah, it so, goes one to four. Obviously, one is not the same game. Uh, two but, isn't the same game either. You want three or four. Yeah, you four definitely ideally. want three or four. Though I think two is more the same game than other games because it is mostly a race. It is mostly a race. There isn't too much player interaction other than blocking off other people's spaces with your workers and also buying cards before other people can buy them. Other than that, there's no contention and there's no player interaction. Uh, yep. But you could make an agri- like Agricola, right? Agricola is a game that has cards, even though it's not deck building, where you know there was the main deck of Agricola cards, the basic one, 
didn't have any player interaction. The only interaction in Agricola is blocking. They could make spaces. a player interaction expansion. Right. Agricola had this, the alternate deck with player interaction cards. They could easily, there, maybe those cards exist and we just didn't see them in our play, but they could easily print more cards that have player interaction, like steal a resource from a friend or, you know, move someone else's magnifying glass backwards or steal someone's book. Yeah. I don't know. I'll, you, you could do so much stuff with that. Um, you know, take someone's monster. I don't yep. know. I would also Whatever. say that if you like this game, you would probably like Crown of Amara in terms of... I, if you like this game, you're going to like Dune Imperium, which is also deck building and worker placement. Well, honestly, if you like <laughs> this game, you're going to like a lot of classic Euros too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um, and vice versa. It's basically just, you know, it's, it's a solid yeah. Euro. I don't think it's a legendary all-time... Game. No, but it's just uh, it's but polished. It's just, it's just it's a well made, it's a really solid, polished Euro. It's it combines balanced. Two of the top mechanics. The rules feel right. Like everything's elegant about it. I have no material it's complaints. Not, it's not broken. Yeah. And seriously, if you know the rules and your friends know the rules and they're like us, this is a thirty to forty minute game tops. You could crank out a few of these in a row. Yep. Yep. I do worry that setup would take a while physically, though. Uh, you don't have to deal out like the spaces and the monsters immediately. Oh yeah, you deal them when you land on them. So I guess it could just be. Yeah, this. I mean, you could deal them when you land on them, or otherwise, but it doesn't matter, right? It's yep. what's the difference? There's no difference. They're 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 face down. So who cares? Yep. Right? But no, this is a solid game that I recommend. Uh, and it's not just because yeah. we haven't played a lot of tabletop games lately. It's like a B B plus, you know, solid game worth playing, worth owning if you got a lot of Euro players. Yeah. Um. You know. I feel the same urge to play it that I feel the urge to play things like Hans and Titanica or like Tempest, like all the games I like. Yeah. It's it's in the I class can, of play games rooms like games room likes. Yeah. The only th- the only thing I guess that I, I don't I think it's lacking game wise is that I don't feel like there's a high uh, even though I sucked at it, right? Uh, it doesn't look like there's a lot of room to like for mastery. Right, it's like in a. F- I feel like with a few more plays, I would and and just knowing all the cards and such. I feel that, like I could play near optimally the second time. Right, and I feel like it's I like could play gonna optimally be a lot. There's going to be a huge luck factor and also a turn order factor. But beyond that, it's like I'm going to be playing the best that close to the best I could be playing, and there isn't like a lot of room yep. to like figure out you know intricacies and small details to to step up my game and get even better at it so if you play games to because you're seeking mat you know strategic mastery there's not a lot of uh, a high skill cap and not a low ceiling right it's like you're gonna you're gonna play it out this has been geek nights with rim and scott special thanks to dj pretzel for the opening music